Uh, I was reminded when we finished yesterday that I had discussed the first and uh, final stage of the servitude epic, that is slavery and capitalism, but it left out feudalism. So let me pick that up right now before we go into primitive communism, which is the subject of today's lecture. Okay. The, uh, the reason I didn't mention it is because uh, frequently, I'm, even though it's one of the most interesting time periods since we have such good historical records, the important thing about the servitude epic is the transition from chattel slavery to wage slavery, that is from the slave stage itself to the capitalist stage. Now, feudalism, to the degree that it has a general crisis of its own, uh, that crisis can be expressed as a quadratic equation, as you'll see right here. What we have is a receding general crisis of slavery and ascending general crisis of capitalism. Now, all of this is how you want to boil down these movies you see about Henry VIII or life in England and France and, uh, in the 1100s and the 1500s, or for that matter in these new shows like Black Sails or Genus Davis's book, uh, movie Cutthroat Island um, with that are pretty dramatic recreations of what life was like. And it looks pretty much like a dogfight, which it was. But what was happening in that period of time uh, between slavery and feudalism, say in Europe between the collapse of the Roman Empire circa 400 AD um, uh, and the rise of capitalism which we can definitively date for discussion purposes as around 1760, 1750 to 1775 uh, in Europe and North America. In that long period of time what was happening was that the primitive nature of the feudal economy was collapsing. It was essentially no different, that is the technological base of the mode of production was essentially no different than it had been in ancient society. What was ascending was the idea of capital accumulation through the system of capitalist economics that we discussed, the invention and coming together of the five essential parts of the Industrial Revolution, which occurred first in Northern Europe and England, and then quickly uh, got found its way to North America. By the way, just let me make one quick comment about North America and England. This revolutionary war that we were heading for in North America was not an anti-imperialist war. What it was, was a colonial war. The British ruling class did everything possible not to export equipment to North America and expertise. This uh, is the classical definition of imperialism. Imperialism is the highest developed stage of capitalism. It's nothing more than shipment of factories and their, and their equipment to cheap labor centers like India. Well, that certainly was not the case. In the, United, in the North American colonies, the colonials were not allowed to have more than 10 employees in a factory. The invention and subsequent movement of the spinning jenny and every other article of textile manufacture that was so important in England, if you were caught smuggling any of that to North America, you would be hung right on the spot. So the North American was, Revolutionary War was not an anti-imperialist war. It was an anti-colonial war. All right, that's uh, enough said about feudalism for the moment. It's simply an, an intermediary stage between chattel slavery and wage slavery. From an economic standpoint, that doesn't amount to much. If you were a slave, on the other hand, it could amount to a great deal. So uh, I think that speaks for itself. Now, as we concluded yesterday, I pointed out that the most important thing that you want to be thinking about is how is it possible that after five million years of living in a system where everybody has everything they want and, no, and everybody has the same stuff, that there is no inequality, so-called egalitarian life, and altruism and social relations exist between individuals, how is it that that transformed in a very short period of time into a system where some people get everything, the mass of producers get nothing, and that is considered to be a normal and happy way of life, at least for the people that have everything. Okay, that's the question Karl Marx wanted to answer. That's the question that he, the reason he tackled in the last seven years of his life, the uh, problem of origins. As I said then, he discovered to his own satisfaction, as you will see in the course of this next hour or so, that this transition occurred in the stage of chiefdoms.
this was not based on archaeological data because we didn't have that data at the time. It was based on his interpretation of the ethnological record. That is, the record of living primitive societies of the 1800s, most of which had been accumulated, the part he was interested in, by Lewis Henry Morgan. And we know that because we have Mark's longhand notes in his ethnological notebooks, which were translated into various languages and in 1972 into English and published by Lawrence Crater. So we have a real good idea of what Marx was after. We also know that he was looking at the probability and possibility of archaeological data coming into the future. Um, it didn't happen in his lifetime, although it started to unfold in Egypt uh, in the work of Flinders Petrie. We might assume that he was familiar with that, but until we get the geological notebooks translated, I at least won't be able to determine that. Now, let's go to the question of primitive communism. The first thing we want to be thinking about is where did humans come from to begin with? That is, what about the ape stock from which mankind emerged? And that is uh, something we can answer real quickly for the purposes of bringing us up to the human stage. 65 odd million years ago, a tremendously big asteroid crashed into the Earth. It impacted the Yucatan Peninsula, um, the center of which was around the current town of Merida, for those of you familiar with Mexican geography. It uh, struck with such a force that it sent a tidal wave several miles high all the way into the North American coast and clear inland and formed a series of mountain chains, which is what's left over of the crust that it was carrying. It threw so much debris into the atmosphere that there was a winter like blackout over a great deal, if not all of the planet, for a couple of years. And it extinguished every life form on Earth, on the land, that had a mature adult size of 65, years, uh, 65 pounds or more, and a great number of oceanic life as well. However, in the subsequent nine million years, a number of small little animals grew up and grass began to uh, spread over the entire world. Grass is important to us later on because most of our crops uh, today, agricultural crops, are modified grass seeds, corn, rice, oats, wheat, barley, rye. All of those are grass seeds. Grasses in the, did not really exist until after the asteroid impact in any great numbers. Uh, of species, so that was an important change in the plant landscape. Tiny little animals, mammals, uh, we call prosimians, with uh, eyes at the side of their head, transformed in the next nine million years in the geological epochs of the Paleocene and the Eocene, so that they had binocular vision with the eyes moving from here to here. Uh, flat nails replaced claws. Prehensile precision grip emerged in the hands. These things are important not just because they allowed these little creatures to live in trees and bushes, but because they are the same centers, they represent an expansion of the same centers of the brain as are involved in abstract thought. That is, those involved in motor control and vision. So this is important. It's important in the sense that it prepared us for the age of monkeys. The first to prehistoric monkeys that uh, we know about come from Egypt, are called Egyptopithecus. They quickly transformed some of them into apes. Let me just mention here that one, one time not so many years ago, a worker asked me, well, if this evolutionary business is true, how come all of the animals didn't change? I couldn't understand the question for a long time. Finally, I figured out what he was getting at. His idea was that if one animal changed, then they should all change. Well, this simply reflects a, he wasn't really aware of our idea of gene pools and how they work. When an evolutionary change occurs in a gene pool, it only occurs in one or a few individuals. We have to wait for environmental selection to determine, that is for a shift in the environment, to determine whether this is going to be useful and so useful that it spreads out and becomes the only manifestation of that gene in the pool. But just because there are some individuals with these new genes doesn't mean that they, anything happens to the others. They just keep on going their merry way 
until such time as an environmental shift selects them out and selects in favor of the new trait. This takes millions of years. This is how biological evolution always works. Anyway, these uh, monkeys, some of them, became apes, or what we call man-like apes. These are the ones that we're most interested in. Man-like apes we call hominoids. When these man-like apes evolve into ape-like men, we call them hominids. When did that happen? Around five to seven million years ago, the Dryopithecine, Ramopithecine group of fossils evolved into what we know from Africa as the Australopithecine fossils. Now, there are actually three stages of human evolution which we're going to talk about. I'm going to see if I can find my chart here to stick up on the... Here it goes. Okay. All right, on the bottom of this particular chart, you're going to see it says Homo, uh, Homo australopithecus, and, it, and then it says 500 cubic centimeters of cranial capacity. Now, that is the first of these hominids that we know was on the line to modern man, and that's why we use the term genus term Homo and the species term Australopithecus. Many of these specimens have now been found. Uh, the first discovery was uh, 1924, 90 years ago, by Raymond Dart in South Africa. Since that time, there have been many sites found in uh, South Africa, East Africa, North Africa, and now sites are being found in other parts of the world, or at least um, we think that they are Australopithecine bones, meaning that they have this species spread out fairly rapidly in the period after five million years ago. It seems to have clearly formed in Africa seven to five million years ago. After this, we have a couple, two and a half million years perhaps of uh, evolution, that is physical evolution among this line of Homo to the level of Homo erectus, which has doubled its brain capacity to about a thousand cubic centimeters of cranial capacity and is now spread into the far northerly regions of Europe and Asia the most inhospitable areas one could probably imagine for a Stone Age person. And uh, then by uh, a million years ago, we have the emergence of modern man, that is Homo sapiens, us, our species. And every kind of uh, racial variant since that time, it would be a subspecies variation. So you might have, for example, Homo sapiens neanderthalensis, or one thing or another. At any rate, that means that for the last million years, we have had a fully human st uh, status. The uh, next thing I want to go into to correspond with that is the evolution of culture. Now, sometime between seven and five million years ago, humanity emerged from the hominoid line. That is, people that were clearly on a new line, a new trajectory. Now, what was that new trajectory? Well, it was the what we call the invention of culture. Now culture, as I might have mentioned before, does not mean uh, in science what it means in everyday talk when you're talking about art and literature and poetry. Culture and in science means what we call a tripartite structure with a mode of production on the bottom consisting of two things, technology and social organization, and on the top we have ideology. These three terms, by the way, were invented uh, by an American named Leslie White uh, after World War II as a mechanism to make Marxism, reintroduce Marxism to North American anthropology. Now, the invention of culture was a dramatic new thing. Um, it's hard to overemphasize it. Let me by start by pointing out that in philosophy, when we use the term matter, we're referring to everything that exists, physical matter and physical energy. But until this time, that's really all that does, did exist as far as we know, physical matter and physical energy. The, intervention, the invention of culture is a third form of matter, a third form of philosophical matter. And in practical everyday terms, it creates an invincible buffer between humanity and its environment. In other words, if you can use stone tools and other tools you make out of bone, atlas, I, antler, ivory, uh, wood, and basketry, and so on, if you can do this, and enter into social relations to collectively use these tools, then you have an invincible new method of defense and offense, a way of earning a living long enough to reproduce. Now this period of primitive communism that is introduced with the Homo australopithecus has a great deal uh, to 
award a, a certain amount of merit, particularly the altruistic way in which people shared and lived with each other. But on the other hand, it's the reason we call it primitive communism is because the technology was so primitive that people are lucky if they live to be 30 years old. Most people died of tooth abscesses. And they would have died in the winter when, because of uh, bad weather. And these are not things that we consider to be admiral characteristics today. The difference between modern communism and primitive communism is as Lewis Henry Morgan said it would be. The rebirth of the ancient of the egalitarianism of the ancient gens, the clans of primitive communist society, on an entirely new technological basis. This was the same conclusion that Marx and Engels had come to, and that's the reason why Marx was so quickly incorporated into uh, the uh, pantheon of Marx's classics. Now, when we take a look at that, uh, we see that all that White did was to select new words for the Marxist phraseology so that uh, Karl Marx's words, forces of production, became technology. His terms, relations of production, became social organization. His terms, superstructure, became ideology. But this entity, whatever you want to call it, whatever terms you want to use, we still use the term mode of production a lot, is uh, interposed between culture and the environment. It uh, gives humanity the opportunity to live long enough to reproduce without any other substantial changes in its anatomy. Normally, what animal and plant species do is make physical anatomical changes, is it not, uh, in order to prepare for a change in the environment. Fundamentally, what separates man-like apes from ape-like men is the emergence of collective production and spending time thinking symboling and, uh, uh, and speaking. Now let's talk, take a look at these things one by one. First of all, the change in sexuality is important because among primates it's sexual contact which keeps the group together. Now chimpanzees have gone a long ways toward being human. Not only is a huge percentage of our DNA exactly the same as chimps, but female receptivity to copulation among chimpanzees has accelerated to the point of a period of time every month. Now in human females there's just one more jump to be made and that's to have daily receptivity to sexual activity. Needless to say this uh, men have to be as constant as they were in chimpanzee times and they continue to be that way as many of you can testify in human times. The uh, other great important jump forward was uh, talking. We have to assume that along with these earliest developments in terms of the uh, physical changes that were taking place in the brain uh, and in the sexual nature of these animals, there was also the change taking place in the voice box so that we could have speech. What does that change have to be? Well, what you have to have in, uh, to change a chimp to a human in terms of uh, speaking is the ability to pronounce phonemes, that is, distinct units of sound. When distinct oh, units of sound... Uh, balls, we want to juggle for a total of three. One of them is sex. And in sexuality of the human nature, its importance is in creating a glue to bring a social together. For that reason, it doesn't really matter whether the sexuality is heterosexual or homosexual. And so we have in the Congo to date, lesbian chimpanzees. We have to assume that there was something similar going on in Australopithecine times, that is the first grade in humanity. The next important thing is talking. Now, we know from our primate studies that chimpanzees and great apes of all kinds can symbolize. They know words. They can, the problem for them is they can't speak. So what's involved? How do you make that jump? Well, you have to have a physiological change in the throat, in the voice box, which allows the pronunciation of phonemes. Phonemes are what we call in anthropological linguistics the most basic units of sound. Phonemes are then grouped into basic units of meaning called morphemes. And then morphemes in turn are, if they're not words in and of themselves, which they're not usually, they are grouped into words.
So this is a physical ability that the mass of chimpanzees uh, don't have. But the important thing for us is that in that period between seven and five million years ago, all three of these balls, abstract thought, human sexual change, and uh, speech, the ability to speak phonemes, all three of those things came into existence. By the time that you see the Australopithecines, that is the first grade of humans, three things should have been in coexistence together. Now, as I said, these things started, these animals began in South and East Africa and quickly expanded over large parts of the Old World, and they kept expanding. They transformed themselves over a period of a couple of million years into the uh, Homo erectus grade. Their cubic centimeter cranial capacity doubled, and their stone tool technology became sufficiently advanced that they could live all year round in the far northern, northern Europe and now, was to tell her, uh, then, uh, you want something to color out all the ultraviolet and all of the other rays, where, which for example, if sunlight, you'll get vitamin D poisoning. Now, on the other hand, you are in the northern region, and there are only a couple months out of the year where you're not wearing a lot of clothes, then you need to have pretty white skin so that you, what little bit of sun you are getting will produce enough vitamin D that you don't get rickets and die. So skin color has to change as you move into more northerly regions, and that of course did happen. But what was what's even more important for us to understand is that what would have been necessary production uh, in uh, in northern Europe was not necessary production in Africa, or the converse. What would have been surplus social product in Africa now becomes necessary social product. In other words, you can spend more time making stone tools and engaging in productive labor the farther north and into the more hostile and challenging environments you move. So this is another mechanism by which early people uh, mediated the problem of having too much on hand. Living with the enemy. You'll recall that we began that discussion in the last uh, lecture. Now we want to make it the focal point of our new lecture. It's one, it was one wonderful jump forward when people learned how to make stone tools and make other tools out of other materials as well using their stone tools. This is the creation of culture, which we've just discussed as a most important step forward, the creation of a new form of philosophical matter and a new form of, of practical matter. Now, living with this enemy, however, of having to, too much on hand it has to be handled constantly. Why is having too much on hand an enemy fact? Because it creates envy, jealousy, and stealing among individuals within a certain group. It's a source of constant amazement to ethnographers, uh, anthropologists who should actually know better, that if you give a, a Kalahari tribesman a watch, for example, he'll say, well, that's really nice, show it to all his friends and so on, and then you notice the next day he left it behind. And it's not just because of the weight, because a watch obviously doesn't weigh all that much and you can strap it to your wrist and it isn't really gonna affect your mobility. What it does affect, however, is if you're the only guy in the band that has a watch, the only man, woman, or child, then you're creating a situation where maybe somebody else would like to have a watch and can't have it. They don't have an anthropologist to come along and give them a watch. They don't have any market economy in which to get it. What they will be getting, some of them may be getting envious, jealous. They may think about stealing it. All of these are centrifugal forces which will tear a primitive society apart. This is something that the Australopithecines had to deal with from the very first moment that they picked up and made a stone tool and made other tools with it. They had to be aware of the fact that ha, this is really wonderful but we don't want to have too much on hand at any given time because that will create the opportunity, in fact the necessity, uh, just for random reasons, of having any unequal distribution of the articles of production. So humanity had had to learn to live with the problem of this being an enemy. Culture was not only its salvation, but it also had within it the seeds of its own destruction. Now, what this meant was, in practice, that people would have to spend time doing something with their social time other than earning a living. 
you take a look at animals in the forest or domesticated animals, all their time they're eating grass or they're looking for something to eat some way, perhaps making some kind of shelter. Um, but for humans, the minute they picked up a stone tool and began to use it as an intermediary with their environment, those days were over. So what are you going to do with the rest of your time? The biggest single thing that we document in the ethnographic record is that people have so much time on hand, they have to come up with some way of, of, of spending it. Now they don't want to spend it in creating articles of distribution which are going to inherently end up unequally distributed. So what do they do? Well, one of the things they did was to encourage talking, symboling, expressing ideas about the world around them. And in the course of that, they're beginning to develop an ideology, a world view. They're beginning to become self-aware. By the time people became Homo erectus, they probably had become self-aware, had a distinct, of course it's mythological, uh, and has no scientific basis, because how could they have a scientific basis without science? They're a long ways from that. But they had some kind of idea about the world in which they lived, and they could express this and talk about it with, among themselves. Those individuals that could do this and do it most effectively have a very definite selective advantage. So definite that within another million years they have already transformed into having 1,500 cubic centimeters of cranial capacity and have become fully homo sapiens. So this is the course of living, what living with the enemy uh, meant. Now, when we took a look at our formula and we had uh, a column called surplus value. Uh, we know that surplus value is something that's inherent to the servitude epic and especially to the capitalist stage. Although in the slave stage surplus value was guaranteed also or produced in much the same way by a gang of slaves under the whip of an overseer who acted as the factory clock. And huge amounts of surplus value were created then. But in the era of primitive communism we don't have surplus value. In fact, we don't even have surplus social product. But the concept of surplus social product we can put into our formula because in mathematics we can do pretty much anything we like as long as we stipulate the conditions and get rid of the idea of surplus value and put in that instead surplus social product. Now the inherent product, there are three stages of primitive communism as far as the physical nature of humanity are concerned. Homo australopithecus, Homo erectus, Homo sapiens. Gradual growth in the size of the brain. Uh, in that same period of time, the sociocultural contradiction continues. The difference between productive potential and how much you actually produce. All primitive societies have more productive potential than they use in the ethnographic record. Even Eskimos can produce far more than they actually do produce. So. This is a continuing contradiction which eventually will not be reconcilable within the same framework of desiring less. In his book, Stone Age Economics, back in 1974, Professor Marshall Sollins explained in considerable detail why it was important to look at primitive society in terms of, in its own terms, rather than in bourgeois, that is, our terms because in our terms it doesn't make any sense to have productive capacity and not use it. In their terms it made every kind of sense. The slogan of the primitive communist is to desire little and you will be affluent. And all primitive communist societies, that is all primitive societies of hunting and gathering bands and early agriculturalists have this same limit. They desire little and so it takes very little to make them affluent, to make them happy in other words. All of that of course has to undergo change and we're going to get to the point in a few minutes to show exactly how that change occurred. But I want you to kind of internalize the idea that there's nothing fundamentally inbred in the human brain about desiring a lot of social products. This is something that didn't even exist until about 6,000 years ago. So for millions of years prior to that, People were very happy because they desired very little. Okay, that's uh, that was the essential lessons of uh, Marshall Solid's book, Stone Age Economics. It's one of the few books that I always carry around with me, um, besides my own and besides Karl Marx's Capital. And uh, I think that's very important. When you look deep within a society, 
you will find the causes for its uh, activity. Sometimes you look deep and you can't see the forest for the trees. An example would be Leslie White and Marvin Harris both got hung up on the idea. Uh, they, both of these men considered themselves Marxist theoreticians, even if they didn't want to advertise it that way. Um, they were certainly both materialists, but what I would call mechanical, not dialectical materialists. And they got hung up on, Harris got hung up on White's idea that human society should be expressible in terms of increasing levels of the efficient use of energy. True enough. And Harris, in one, in one edition of his textbook after another, creates increasingly complex formulas to um, show that one society, which is more advanced than another, is so because it has a greater degree of energy efficiency, energy utilization efficiency. All of which is true, but all of which is irrelevant. The important thing that these guys missed was that the time that was required to produce the things that they wanted to be affluent and continued to decrease as their energy efficient efficiency continued to uh, improve. But what was really happening was more and more of their time was being deflected into other areas, into mythology, which is another way of looking at worldview, um, uh, into art and handicrafts, into anything and everything. Um, that was the important thing. Not that the increasing energy efficiency was driving society forward. It wasn't. What was driving society forward was the way in which you used all your spare time. Now, we want to skip ahead to uh, the next point. So, the column over here that says surplus value in the earlier stages now says surplus social product. And that is um, how we re inject Marx's formula back into the prehistoric communist period. We simply change the content of it from surplus value to surplus social product and we see that in the third band stage of Homo sapiens we have the same general crisis as we had in the first two band stages which is the contradiction between what you can produce and what you want to produce or what you really don't want to produce. In other words, it's a self-governing governor, a self-acting governor on society's production, which is a, a contradiction. A general crisis uh, emerges as a consequence. But it's resolved as humans get, sm get larger brains, get smarter in other words, and move into more hostile regions where yesterday's surplus is today's necessity. In other words, making clothes and everything, the tools that you have to have to make those clothes was, would have been surplus activity and unnecessary in Africa. But in Holland, England, places like that, it was essential because you don't, uh, you have to have clothes in order to survive in the winter. And certainly in northern Russia, uh, northern China, uh, and all of those areas, and eventually, of course, in North America, which is another topic. Now. What this means is that by uh, 110,000 years ago, we can tell in the archaeological record, there is nothing in the uh, natural environment which is not being effectively exploited by peoples somewhere, someplace. This is what Professor Kotak has called the broad spectrum revolution. And it means, what he means by that is a broad spectrum of wild animal and plant resources are at the disposal of humanity. All kinds of tools have been invented to, to deal with that. All kinds of solutions. And out of that is coming a very steady food supply and an increasingly semi-sedentary, at least, way of life. People are not constantly on the move. Um, they may move from one place to another seasonally. They may even stay in one seaside camp along the French Riviera for many, many years. By 400,000 years ago, we know that was the case. Uh, they even have proto-commoditized labor power. You remember that labor power, scientifically defined, means a group of factory workers at a bench working at the same thing, and that while some may be more efficient and faster workers than others, 
the overall project, uh, product of 20 or 200 or 2,000 men is what we call in a unit time, say one hour, uh, as a unit of labor power. Well, this can, has also been achieved uh, by half a million years ago in other parts of the world in a more primitive form. You have, for example, in South Africa, the wide-scale burning of grasslands, which requires the collective effort of an entire tribe, and uh, the point being to clear the land for the production of nuts and gathering of nuts. Um, we can go through archaeological and archaeological example after example of a proto-commoditization of labor power. So that in our, in our formula here, we can see that these things that we have so clearly defined with specific content in the capitalist stage, then applied to the slave stage, can actually be projected into the stages of primitive communism. Now, this broad spectrum revolution came to a head by 20,000 years ago all over the old world, and in fact in the new world too. And what we have after that is the beginning of the agricultural revolution. Now, the agricultural revolution um, has been recognized for a long time as being a great transformation part of uh, human history. V. Gordon Child uh, invented the phrase Neolithic Revolution. He wrote several books like Man Makes Himself um, that were extremely popular. And during when I was growing up, they were on newsstands. The basic idea that uh, Child's put forward was that the invention of animal and plant domestication created an irreversible supply of surplus and humanity could expand and do all kinds of wonderful things. Well, one thing we do know is that it was an irreversible supply, uh, rever uh, release of surplus social product. And as such, the, this is the last phase of primitive communism because it's setting us up for the transition to the servitude epic, and it's making that transition inevitable. And that's going to be our last quick uh, subject matter uh, on today, and that is the rise of the chief, chiefdom solutions, the point in history at which Karl Marx said, this is when, he did this based on his study of Morgan's work and Tyler and Maine and other early anthropologists. Uh, and the whole idea was of the chiefdom societies of that time in the late, late 1800s, um, you could see what prehistorically must have happened. And of course, the archaeological record was key. We have that record now, and we can say that that's exactly what happened. There was a transformation between hunting and gathering and the, uh, the emergence of class and state society characterized by chiefdoms. We see this record very clearly in the New World especially, thanks to the work of one of my mentors, Richard S. McNeish, who uh, did the excavations in the Tehuacan Valley of Mexico, five volumes of which were subsequently printed by the University of Texas Press. Then he did the same thing in Peru, and five volumes of which are on the Valley of Ayacucho, also done by the University of Texas Press, I believe. and. Uh, what we have here is a continuous in-ground sequence of social evolution proven archaeologically and we can see exactly the point at which society began to come apart into social ranks and into and these ranks would eventually become social classes. Now there are several things that happen in the period of chiefdoms but the first economic part is this. All of these farms that existed in tribal agriculture are continuing in the simple chiefdom stage. The difference is that instead of having a tribal council making all the decisions about collection and redistribution of surplus social product, we now have a chief acting, probably a woman frequently, acting with her consigliori, that we might call them, like uh, advisors from Lafia clans who sit on the board and uh, be sure that their input is uh, taken, meaning that their clan within the tribe is being properly represented in terms of how its contributions to the center are being handled. So the farms are all doing what they always did under tribal agriculture. The difference is that instead of a tribal council sitting there, we have a chief. Now the chief is probably subject to immediate recall, just like the boss of a pirate gang or like a, uh, a, a uh, tribal council for that matter. 
the important thing is you have a centralization of power authority. Now, where this stuff is being redistributed, these, this farming goods on, we have the be another process beginning at the same time, and that is the process of professional specialization. Up until this time, all men did the same thing, all women did the same thing, and all children learned to follow their sex-determined roles. But with the emergence of the chieftain, what we see is emerging professional specialists. For example, uh, along the Peruvian coast, I did a study many where we were able to show that profession had emerged in a particular Peruvian valley, and we will demonstrate that on the basis of a unit production of pottery types, utilitarian pottery. What was part of was an inter-valley irrigation system, where a huge gang of men were involved in digging and maintaining this irrigation system. Other gangs of men were involved in uh, planting and harvesting and taking care of agricultural fields. But these people still needed a lot of things, and so did their wives at home. Some of the pottery manufacture was still being done by women, but more and more women were following other kinds of pursuits as well. There had to be a certain specialization in the production of utilitarian pottery, because just because you had all these other things doesn't mean that you didn't need the same domestic items that you'd always needed. And so small groups of professional specialists emerged that were making pottery full-time. Other specialists made stone tools full-time and so forth. So we have the beginning of professional specialization. Now, professional specialization leads to the formation of groups with different economic interests, some of which may be antagonistic, even if they begin as non-antagonistic. For example, what happens if you have a drought, a hurricane, a tornado, a flood, uh, one of many different kinds of things that can affect agricultural production? Well, you may drain your warehouse of the surpluses you've set up for hard times, but uh, you also could be end up shortchanging these professional specialists who fundamentally don't have any other source of food or clothing or other things they need except for what they get from the chief. So you have set up groups of haves and potentially have-nots. All it takes is a certain kind of environmental dislocation and you may have a socio-cultural dislocation as well. So the chiefdoms have a bunch of economic contradictions inherent within them. They may not be immediately apparent. The other thing that we have to take into account is the, un uh, is the probability that the chief and her retainers and consigliori have gotten used to the idea that they can dip into the cash flow whenever they like. They have a great, they have acquired a certain amount of social security. Um, after all, who knows what, who's borrowing from the warehouse and who is not. So this is a new kind of uh, affluence which never existed before. There's one other thing I want to mention real quickly. This is a Russian scientist named Chayanov many years ago uh, published a number of books and uh, articles about uh, unequal in distribution in farms and what he came up with was what we call Chionov's rule which says that the more able-bodied men there are in a farm household the less work each of them will do or conversely the fewer able-bodied men there are in every farming household the more each of them will have to work. Now what this is telling us is that each household has realized a, a certain limit of production they don't want to produce more than a certain amount. Why? Well, first of all, it's agreed upon that they're only going to keep within the household for their own use whatever they need times the number of individuals. Everything else is going to the center. So why produce an awful lot more than you need to send to the center? Just about anything might be fine with the center. And uh, that is an, another governor that's acting on production. It's the last continuation of the primitive communist idea of affluence being having, desiring little and uh, being happy when you have it. This continues into the uh, primitive chiefdom period. But let's cut to the chase here. What is the general crisis of the primitive chiefdoms? It is that so a difference, different groups have been created with different inherent interests which will sooner or later become antagonistic economic interests. And at the same time, the idea that some people have more than others has taken hold as a part of everyday life. 
So we have both a transformation in the superstructure or an ideology of the ideas that people have about sharing and we have a transition in the mode of production in the de facto fact that people are not going to have the same thing all the time in terms of production. This is what the simple chiefdom is confronted with. Now, if things get really bad, people may just say, I've had enough of this crap. I'm going to go back to my old Neolithic way of farming. I'm taking my wife and kids and a couple of my friends and we're going to go start our own farm down the river, way away from you guys, and forget about you. The simple chieftain will dissolve if this is what happens in large numbers. How does a simple chieftain avoid this kind of social dissolution when the state has not yet come into existence? In other words, the center does not have a police and an army to send out and say, oh no, you try and go away and we will kill you, or at the very least we'll put you in change. And at the very least we'll give you a severe beating. Now that doesn't exist. So what does exist? Well historically we know in the archaeological record that what exists is religion. Religion convinces these people to give the center more authority and to do it voluntarily. In fact, be happy about it. Now these religions emerge in all of these simple chieftain societies all over the old world and the new world where we have records. Some of our best records, again, as with agricultural revolution, are not in the old world where you would think they would be, but here in the new world, thanks again to the work of uh, Richard S. McNeish and his many associates in the Tehuacan Valley and the Ayacucho Valley. The religions we know in Mexico, for example, we call it the Olmec. Those of you who have traveled to Mexico will have seen many of the Olmec archaeological sites and monuments. This in Peru, those of you who have traveled to Peru will have seen some of the Shemin temples and the Shemin monuments. What do these religions have in common? Well, the outward manifestations are unimportant. We don't care whether they have snakes or jaguars or whatever that they're telling stories about. The important thing is that these religions preach social unity and the giving, voluntary giving over of authority to the center. The priests up there play a lot of tricks on these people. They have calendars. They correlate the time. They're the ones who know precisely at what time the moon, uh, in what phase of the moon, you should be planning this or that. And they don't stop just at having calendars with all kinds of magical significance to it. There's an Olmec temple in uh, uh, near Veracruz, for example. I mean, you can see movies about it. I've actually been there, where. There's a tunnel that leads down from the major place where a priest would get up and be given speeches, down underneath the ground to another spot. Now, the whole point to this was he could disappear in a puff of smoke in one place, run down that tunnel, and jump up in the other place. Now, to all the rubes that are out there watching, they're thinking, wow, if he could do that, he must know a lot. We better give him some authority. Um, all of these little tricks that they play that... Uh, in fact, tricks like that are still being played on people today, but they show you that the advanced theocratic chiefdom is an adequate way of dealing with the problems of potential social dissolution in the simple chiefdoms. And wherever it exists, whether it's Longshan in China, the Sun cult in Egypt, um, uh, uh, there's an on end cult in Mesopotamia, the Olmec in Mexico, the Shemin, Paracas in Peru, they all have this one thing in common. They last about a thousand years and they all preach unity, voluntary giving over as part of your religious obligations. Now, that won't last forever. Someday the contradictions between the mass of producers and the situation they're confronting will be so great that they'll say, I've had enough of this, I'm going somewhere else. When they do, that society will collapse. Or they'll say, I want to be the ones on top and step home and sing over there. It's all over money and he's so easy. He spends all his time drinking beer and uh, screaming all of the women in the temple. Oh, I, I, want to, I would rather be doing that than having him do that. Whatever the motivation may be, it could lead to civil war. It did lead to civil war all over Mexico and Peru and uh, time and time again. In fact, by the time that Cortez landed in uh, Veracruz, hundreds of years later, this had happened so many times that uh, the Indians were getting ready to do it again. <laughs>
they were sick of Mexico and they were just looking for an excuse to revolt against Mexican rule, Mexico meaning Mexico City, the city of Tenochtitlan. The, um, and he came around at exactly the right time. He had a lot of things going for him. He had a woman who has come from the Aztec city herself as his concubine. Um, he had a couple of hundred of other white men who, uh, all of these white men were supposed to show up uh, in Mexico at that particular time, according to their own mythology. He had many different things going for him, and he proved to be a very competent military commander, and he recruited an army of some 50,000 Indians to march on Mexico City. That's another story. But my point is that these religious uh, attempts to hold on to power were very successful. Eventually, they too would have to uh, give way to the origin of the state. Now, the state emerged in Mexico and Peru, in Egypt and Mesopotamia and nuclear China, uh, all about the same time in the old world and about the same time in the new world. It was offset by a couple thousand years in the new world because the whole process had been offset by the simple fact that there was very little in the way of domesticatable plants and animals in the new world compared to the old world. And so the agricultural revolution had taken longer to uh, take hold in, North, in the entire new world than it had in the old world. In the old world you had rice, wheat, uh, rye, barley, you had pigs, cattle, chicken, all kinds of animals, sheep, goats. So early on the Neolithic Revolution was able to take over. But in the New World you had no practically domesticated animals other than a few turkeys and guinea pigs and that really isn't the same thing as a horse, a cow, a sheep, pig. And uh, you had only one real grass that was domesticatable and uh, well there were several that were domesticatable but only one that was really effective and that was corn. Peru had potatoes which they got from the which is not a, a, a grass seed, and which they were able to pull out of the Amazon and make into a staple. So that in the time I was having my adventures in Peru, there were over 200 varieties of potatoes in an Ayacucho market. But at any rate, the important thing that we want to realize here is the state, that is the army and police in private hands, did emerge in all of these areas of the old world and new world. And when it did, that became the chief organizing principle and the um, theocrats went to second, becoming second in importance. Mel Gibson's new movie, Apocalypto, shows this ATC, Advanced Theocratic Chiefdom, at the point of collapse when the Spanish arrive on the coast perfectly. If you haven't seen that movie, you want to see it because you'll see what an Advanced Theocratic Chiefdom was like in practice. And it, it'll be easier to put a, a picture in your mind on the actual events that were transpiring that we've been talking about here in the abstract. So we have the origin of religion and the origin of the state both in the advanced theocratic chiefdom stage and we have this complete transformation of human thought from altruism to sadism, from uh, being sharing everything to being selfish about virtually everything. These are the transformations which had to occur mentally that is in a superstructure to correspond with the transformations that were occurring in the mode of production, and they did. Of course, we could go into great detail in all of these different things, but not in this particular lecture. Those of you who are interested, remember, go to my book, The ABCs of Communism, Bolshevism 2014. There are chapters on each one of these things, and sections under those chapters where you can read about it in considerable detail for those of you who are interested. Now, in our next lecture, where we will have We'll start with the period of socialism, that is the period of 1917 forward. 1917 is the period of the Russian Revolution when Lenin introduced for the first time in 6,000 years a government of people who had been oppressed and suppressed as um, now the oppressors and suppressors of their former enemies. The entire world changed in 1917 and in the next lecture we'll talk about how that happened.